King of creation, O oh, my soul, praise Him for He is your help and salvation. Come, all who hear, now to His altar draw near. Joining in glad adoration, praise to the Lord who shall prosper our work and defend us. Surely His goodness and mercy shall daily attend us. Ponder on you what the Almighty can do, who with His love will In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord be with you. Welcome to this year's Laetare Sunday Mass in a different location and in a different mode. We're here this morning in the chapel of the School of Theology and Ministry in Symbole Hall. And we come to pray. And I'm grateful that so many are participating being live stream. And as we then enter into this Eucharist, let's take a moment to recall God's blessings in our lives and ask him for his pardon and peace. You came to gather the nations in the peace of God's kingdom, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. You come in word and sacrament to strengthen us in the spirit, Christ of mercy. Christ of mercy, you will come in glory with salvation for your people, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And if you would be seated, please. Our scripture passages this morning will be read by Dr. Susan Gennaro, professor in the Cannell School of Nursing and also its dean. A reading from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them. 
for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven has given to me. And he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever therefore among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted, lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whomever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the verdict that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his words might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise we come today to celebrate Laetari Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Lent. And we know that the word Laetari means to rejoice. And the church asks us in this middle point of Lent to recall that we are to be people of joy and hope. Certainly not easy in the last 12 months as we have been dealing with the effects of the coronavirus, possibly losing some individuals to the effects of the virus also facing added economic and social pressures. It seems to me the central challenge of this Laetare Sunday and its readings is this. How can we rejoice in our lives, not just today, but always, and live out our calling as human beings, believers, individuals linked to the Catholic Church. I have two main thoughts for your consideration. First, it occurs to me that before we can rejoice, we need to be mindful of our joys and then rejoy them, if you will. Recall the reason for rejoicing. And that leads me to a question often asked by Father Michael Himes, a longtime theology faculty member at Boston College. And his question often in talks to students is this. What gives you joy? Perhaps in a way of helping you answer that, how I would respond might give you some fuel for your own thinking and prayer. How do I find joy in my life? Where do I experience it? I'll say three ways, three words, faith, friends, and vocation. First, faith. I grew up in an atmosphere of believing Catholicism in a predominantly Irish farming, farming community in Iowa. Going to Mass on Sundays was part of life. And so were weddings, funerals, First Communions, Easter celebrations. 
I breathed in a faith and an ethos shaped by prayer, sacraments, and a sense of God that has been foundational for me and still gives me strength and joy. I also know that friends, Jesuits as well as laymen and women, have been and remain great sources of joy for me. These relationships and bonds have been so meaningful and important and a cause for much rejoicing by me. And then the word vocation. In my case, to be a Jesuit priest. For others, it could be marriage, lay state. For me, to be a Jesuit priest and the ministry that's linked to that are great sources of joy and hope. I sometimes tell people that I am a Jesuit who happens to be president of Boston College, not a president of Boston College who happens to be a Jesuit. And so Leitari Sunday 2021 poses a question for us about what brings us joy. And then in addition, the readings have a message for us about our lives, how we can rejoice, live better, be more at peace. I suggest that this day invites us to reflect on our relationship with God and others, particularly about where we need healing and forgiveness, and also how we are invited to serve. The first reading from the book of Chronicles describes momentous developments in the history of the people of Israel, their infidelity to God, the destruction of the temple, exile for 70 years. The passage goes on to tell us about how the king of Persia influenced, we are told by the Lord, to allow the people to return to Jerusalem, and in doing so, giving them cause for celebration, hope, and opportunity to rebuild their relationship with God. And then Paul, writing to the Ephesians, reminds that God is rich in mercy, that he has great love for us, that we are saved by his grace, not our efforts. That reading stresses that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works and that we should walk in them, that is, do good and help make God more present through our actions. Today is a good time to recall that God does not expect perfection from us, but he does call us to combine love and truth in our lives, to share with others the gifts that we have freely been given and go about doing good in the example of Christ. This season of Lent and Laetare Sunday invite us to review the history of our lives consider the core teachings of our faith, what we value, and what guides us. It's a day in which the gospel challenges us to reflect on the words of Jesus to Nicodemus, that he has come so that all who believe may have eternal life, that Christ has been sent not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved by him and that his followers might move from darkness and evil to light and truth. Leitari Sunday then asks us to consider what brings us life, what brings us joy and hope. 
being attentive to those aspects of our lives is critical in our day because it's so easy to be overwhelmed by problems or negative events that receive so much attention in the media. Worries about declining health, advancing age, financial and job pressures, and family issues can also rob us of perspective and peace of mind. We need to pause each day to recall how God has blessed us and to remind ourselves that he has not and will not leave us orphans. So I say this day encourages us to ask how we can give more life to those around us, how we can provide more encouragement and inspiration. Acts of charity and goodness can have such a powerful impact no matter how small they might seem. Just as seeds planted eventually germinate, grow, and then yield much fruit, so can we in our lives as we do good, as we go about imitating the example of Christ, the saints, our family, and our friends. More and more, I am convinced that grandparents, aunts, and uncles have special opportunities to support and challenge younger people about the values, beliefs, and the important aspects of our Catholic faith. People who are in that category of grandparents or older relatives and friends so often have, have wisdom, valuable perspectives on life, and time to listen and share the fruit of their experiences. Certainly all of us are called to be sources and examples of integrity, commitment, hope, faith, joy, whatever our ages, gifts, and occupations. We gather here at Boston College, this Jesuit institution founded by members of the Society of Jesus. And the founder of the Jesuit order wanted Jesuit schools and their students and grads to prepare capable and zealous leaders who would be a leaven for good in wider society, no matter where they were and what they did. We share in that mission. And so today reminds us, as we're in the season of Lent and celebrating Laetare Sunday, that we are about light and life. Those are key elements in our preparation for Easter. And so we are invited to pray that more and more we will be people who live with hope and joy, who draw strength from other people, Christ, and the church, so that we can continue working for the greater glory of God. And as people of faith and whose lives have been touched by Christ and grace, let us join now in praying together the words of the Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the Son with the, with the Father is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so as children of the light and called to live lives of joy, we turn now out of our faith and hope and offer these prayers. For the church, that we may embrace this Lenten journey of repentance and conversion with courage, trusting God's living word to feed us. We pray to the Lord. Lord For all the people of God, that we let go of resentments, judgments, and every sense of entitlement that divides us and live from the grace that surrounds us always. We pray to the Lord. For the poor and powerless in our society, that we may hear their voices, understand their pain, and humbly walk alongside of them through life's challenges, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our Boston College community, alumni, students, faculty, staff, administrators, and benefactors, that we may always strive to form women and men capable of shaping the future with vision, justice, and charity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all suffering with the COVID virus, that God will heal them, give strength to their caregivers, and guide public health officials in promoting safe practices and effective vaccine distribution. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For eternal rest for our departed loved ones, especially John Wisler, 57, who guided the Boston College Alumni Association for more than three decades. But families, friends, graduates, alumni, and other close to the heart of Boston College, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, who never ceases the work of removing the blindness of our eyes, break through the darkness in our hearts and our world and answer these prayers and those that remain in the silence of our hearts so that we can continue working for your greater honor and glory. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
And let's pray that my sacrifice and yours might be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We place before you with joy these offerings, which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And, lift them up to the Lord. and let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you so love the world that in your mercy, you sent to us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might live, might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the saints and angels, we too give thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. Holy, holy, You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life, and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, Sean, our bishop, and all the clergy. 
Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, St. Ignatius, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, with your spirit. and wherever you are this morning, maybe you can greet those members of the household that you're with and extend a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. O God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts, we pray, with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty and love you in all sincerity. Through Christ our Lord. And before we go, let me say how delighted I am that we have been able to have this Mass together. I'm grateful to the Alumni Association, to the Information Technology staff at Boston College, and also to the members of Campus Ministry who have enabled us to come and pray, even though in this live stream fashion, but still very much a time of prayer. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Eucharist is ended. Let's go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Leah DeCosta Spencer, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations and University Commencement Director. It is so great to have so many of you with us online on this very special day, which marks the midpoint of Lent. Laetari Sunday has been celebrated at Boston College for 70 years, and though our circumstances today are unconventional, I am so glad that you can be with us here today to rejoice in the anticipation of the coming Easter feast and sharing in a day of hope and encouragement in the midst of the penitential season. As this is the first time we have offered this service virtually, I am delighted to share that we have more than 900 members of the Boston College community tuning in with alumni, parents, and friends from over 40 states and 13 countries represented here this morning. As part of this remarkable turnout, I would like to take a special moment to recognize our Golden Eagles, members of the class of 1971, celebrating their 50th class anniversary, as well as our Silver Eagles, members of the class of 1996, celebrating their 25th class anniversary with us this year. Welcome. I would also like to take a moment to recognize all of our frontline responders watching right now and offer a heartfelt thank you from all of us here at Boston College. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for all that you've done to fight the pandemic over the past year. You were all truly men and women for others. And now I am honored to introduce University President William P. Leahy of the Society of Jesus. Father Leahy is currently celebrating his 25th year as president of Boston College. And over the course of his tenure, the university has continued to grow stronger to secure its place among the nation's top academic institutions. Please join me in welcoming the 25th president of Boston College, Father William P. Leahy. Thank you, Leah, and all in our alumni area and advancement who worked so hard to make this event possible. And I have a chance to give you a brief update about key activities and events at Boston College, something that I've always done following mass and part of our Laetari Sunday ceremony. And I'd like to begin by talking about COVID-19 and how our university community has responded. Many of you may know that we started our classes as normal as possible in August because we thought it was critical for the education of our students and also their psychological health that they be able to come to campus and participate in as many in-person courses as possible. To make that happen, to make that possible, we had to engage in a massive testing, quarantine, and isolation program. Since August, we have come close to giving out 250,000 tests to our campus community, students, faculty, and staff. And of those roughly 250,000 tests that we've administered, a little under nine, a little over a thousand, nine hundred and some, nine sixty eight have tested positive. So we have a very low positivity rate. And that's because the vast majority of our community have worked so hard in following the regulations from the Center for Disease Control about prevention, that is, wearing masks and maintaining physical distancing. The other night, I was with some of the Heitzman, which is an a cappella group here on campus, and they were remarking about how we have developed a mask culture at BC, and that comes out of this commitment to one another and this wonderful desire to be able to have classes and to participate in an academic year with one another. We've had our moments where we've had 
increases in the virus and we've had to deal with those, but as we near the midpoint of the second semester, I can say that because of the tremendous commitment and efforts of students, faculty, and staff, we are well on our way to completing the whole academic year and doing that in a way that is helpful to the learning process and I also think to human growth. I also want to say a word about commencement because that's much on the mind of some of our current seniors and parents. We deal with state regulations here in Massachusetts that are more stringent than in other states and we also have to have a permit from the city of Boston for any event such as graduation. Right now what we're looking at is an in-person graduation that would be in alumni stadium but because of limitations on us it's only going to be for graduates at this point. We're, we're waiting to see what else may happen as more vaccination occurs and warmer weather comes upon us that may reduce some of the concerns of the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. We know that we have to follow their guidelines as we go forward. And if I could to a word to the parents and individuals who may have been part of last year's graduating class, we recently did a survey of the grads of 2020 asking what their preferences were because we do want to honor them and recognize their commencement ceremony, have that for them. And so at the moment, we're looking at something that will be in the fall. That's the preference of the class. The overwhelming vote of the class in a survey was to do something in the fall. And then for new students coming in, we are a very fortunate institution. We have had almost 40,000 applications, more than a 30% increase from a year ago. Decisions about those who, are, who will be admitted in the regular admission process should be sent out somewhere around March 25th. So we have commencement, we have a new bunch of students coming in, and then if I could a word about campus construction and the physical surroundings that we're in. We happen to be on the Brighton campus here this morning in this chapel. A little bit down the hill from where we are is the Harrington Athletics Village. Earlier this year, we finished the Pete Frady Center, which is a facility for baseball and softball. That has been so warmly received, and I might add, had a, I think it's had a big effect upon both the softball and baseball players. Our baseball team, for instance, is I think ranked number 13th in the country. And a lot of that is due to being able to practice indoors during the winter months. We also have, if you go to the main campus, what some of you would have known as Cushing Hall, the home of the School of Nursing before it moved into Maloney Hall, is the site now for a major construction project this will be the new home of an institute called the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society. It is well underway, should be done by late this fall, and it will be home not only for this new venture in human engineering, human-centered engineering, but also provide classrooms, a small lecture hall, and wonderful gathering spaces for the undergraduate and graduate community at Boston College. What we're trying to do is be more interdisciplinary in the way we teach and research and engage students and faculty. So this facility, which is a large building, it's almost 160,000 square feet. So it's a sizable presence, Gothic style. I think it's actually going to look tremendous. And then if I could, a word about the integration of Pine Manor College to Boston College. Pine Manor College is located about 1.3 miles from McElroy Hall, that is the intersection of Beacon and College Road. It's in Brookline, a campus of between 45 and 50 acres. And BC entered into negotiations with the Pine Manor College Board of Trustees last 
April and May, and we eventually agreed that we would work on integrating Pine Manor into BC. And so we are, we, this last year, this current year, are involved in teaching out the students that they currently had. We want to make sure they have a chance to complete degrees or at least be in shape to move on to other institutions. That teach out agreement ends in June of 2022, so there's another year to go. And we're working now on how might we use the Pine Manor College campus. And as part of this integration agreement, we said that we would establish a new initiative called the Pine Manor Institute for Student Success. One of the great contributions Pine Manor College has made over the years is helping underrepresented, underserved populations go to college and earn their degrees. We would like to continue that initiative and we have set up an endowment as part of the integration of Pine Manor College into Boston College. More to come on what that will mean for us as 2022 comes closer. And then I want to give you a little sense of what's been happening with the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. This is something we announced last summer. We've had a number of activities. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the dean of the Cannell School, Dr. Gennaro, is with us. She and her colleagues had an opening event as part of the forum talking about how can we in the United States, but in particular on our campus, engage questions about racial justice. How do we respond to the needs that are so evident in our world? This forum is to be both a resource for that kind of dialogue, reconciliation, engagement, but also a catalyst for discussion and consideration of all kinds of needs that we face in our country. So that's a little sense of what we've been doing this year at Boston College. And as I close, I just might remind you that Campus Ministry plans to live stream Holy Week services starting with Palm Sunday. And there'll be information that'll be provided, but we will live stream Palm Sunday Mass, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, and Easter Sunday at the chapel on Trinity uh, the Trinity Chapel on the Newton campus. This year, we will have students on campus, so we need to be in a larger venue than what this current chapel we're in will allow to participate. So I wanted you to know that will be live streamed, and I'm sure that Leah and her wonderful staff in the alumni office will publicize, send you information about the Holy Week services. So with all that, I will say it's time for me to go and you can hear more about people who will be speaking to you as part of Leitari Sunday. I'm glad I could be with you and next year I think we will be on campus back to our usual mass and Conti Forum brunch and then opportunity to see one another face to face. I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Leahy, for your remarks here today and for your steadfast leadership of this great university over the past 25 years. I would now like to introduce our alumni board president, Eric Silva. Eric is a Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences graduate from the class of 2000, currently serving in his first year as president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. Eric also serves as founding principal of North-South Government Strategies in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted he is here today to introduce our keynote speaker, Father Matthew Malone. Eric, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Good morning, and Leah, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm Eric Silva, a proud graduate of Boston College, class of 2000, 
and I currently also serve as president of the Board of Directors of the Boston College Alumni Association. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I have the special privilege of introducing our guest speaker uh, today, who's Father Matthew Malone from the Society of Jesus. Father Malone is a president and editor-in-chief of America Media, a position he's occupied since 2012. Father Malone entered the Society of Jesus in 2002 and was ordained in 2012 by Edward Cardinal Egan, late Archbishop of New York. Prior to religious life, Father Malone served as special representative and speechwriter to U.S. Representative Marty Meehan. He also served as founding deputy director of Mass Inc., an independent political think tank and co-publisher of Commonwealth, its award-winning review of politics, ideas, and civil life. In addition to serving on the Board of Trustees at Boston College, Father Malone serves as the Board of Directors of the Catholic Medical Mission Board and the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Father Malone. My brothers and sisters, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your generous invitation to speak to you today. In the late spring of 1963, during what would prove to be the autumn of his life, President John F. Kennedy delivered the commencement address at American University in Washington, D.C. It was perhaps surprising to some of us in Boston that this Irish Catholic son of Massachusetts began his address by quoting the words of an English poet. There are few earthly things more beautiful than a university, John Macefield wrote. It is here that those who hate ignorance may strive to know, and those who perceive truth may strive to make others see. In his address that day, the president spoke about the urgent need to pursue the cause of peace, and he made an eloquent plea for re-examining the entire country's attitude toward the Soviet Union. At the height of the Cold War, just a few months after the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy saw that we had no more urgent task. Yet his interest in the subject, in the cause of peace, was not something that he had recently acquired. Because in his commencement address at Boston College seven years earlier, Senator Kennedy told the class of 1956 that this was the cause of their generation, that they faced monumental issues of war and peace, with the fate of Western civilization hanging in the balance, for nothing less than the survival of our faith and our country are at stake. Kennedy's decision to speak of peace above the drums of war was not the product of some fanciful idealism or romantic illusion, for he knew, like most realists, that neither of those fantasies was adequate to the task. Now, what brought Kennedy to the rostrum that day was a simple hope. We all inhabit this small planet, he said. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. All these years later, the fact of that common mortality is a lesson we have learned anew. As we watched over this last year, often through bitter and agonizing tears, the devastation of a global pandemic, a pandemic that none of us were immune from and few of us ever expected. And so as we gather on this Latare Sunday, it may seem to many of us that we should be gathering to mourn rather than to celebrate. For who speaks of peace in the face of war? And these many months of turmoil and death have almost made it seem like that last Lent, when the pandemic began, never really ended. Yet that distinction between celebration and mourning is a false choice. 
Lent does not exist for its own sake. It is not some self-contained unit. Lent is inextricably connected to Easter. Just as winter does not exist except for spring, Lent does not exist except for Easter. They are one reality, born of the life and the death and the resurrection of the one Lord, the person we proclaim at Mass to be our blessed hope. And so our gathering today, in his name, even virtually, is therefore a celebration of hope. Not in spite of what has happened, but because of what has happened. Because hope is the truth that makes what happened survivable. It is not the belief that all will be well in the end. And it is not naive optimism. Rather, hope is the faith that whatever happens will have within it the power of calling forth from us a deeper response to God and to one another. And that with God and with one another, we do not face the world alone. Hope is the hinge on which the door from past to future opens, for it gives us the faith to love again, to try again. So our gathering this Sunday is nothing more and nothing less than a witness to that audacious and unyielding hope that comes from us, that comes to us from the one who is hope. But it does not come to us through some invisible force that we neither know nor affect. The gift of hope comes to us from our lived experience, from our living together, through our experience of one another and the experience of our forebears. For if hope is the hinge that connects past, present, and future, then those who came before us are as much a part of our present as those whose future we serve today. And when we look to that history, we see plenty that is different, yet much that is remarkably the same. Back in 1963, when John F. Kennedy spoke from a place of hope at a time when war threatened peace, it was also a time when politics seemed little more than an endless series of conflicts among ideological partisans. When the nation was yet again in the throes of another traumatic reckoning with our legacy of slavery, with the reality of racism. Yet to those folks in 1963 who heard that speech, how different that world must have seemed from the world of 1863, a century earlier, when the Massachusetts legislature at last approved the charter of Boston College. It was in 1863 that what would become this world-class university began officially as just a few Jesuits and their students occupying a building and a half on Harrison Avenue. Those teachers and students were toiling away in the hope that their education rooted in their faith would give them the best chance, not just to be faithful disciples of the Lord, but faithful citizens in a city and a country that was still hostile to those hopes. Yet while they were toiling away in hope, the deadliest war in American history was raging around them. 
the ferocious Battle of Chancellorsville occurred that spring. The siege of Vicksburg began in June. All of it accompanied, as war always is, by epidemics, by disease, by suffering, by death. And that summer, of course, was the Battle of Gettysburg. Yet 1863 was also the year of the Gettysburg Address. 1863 was the first Thanksgiving in this country's history. 1863 was the year that the glory of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment at Fort Wagner, South Carolina, entered into eternity. And that year was the start in the Commonwealth's eyes for our fellow Eagles. Boston College began in hope, in a time of conflict. And Boston will endure in hope, for indeed our whole history testifies to the power of hope. For from those humble beginnings on Harrison Avenue, a great university was born. And for more than 158 years, in the midst of triumph, and tragedy. This college has fulfilled its mission, and in doing so it has steadily raised the standard of academic excellence. It has provided a forum for personal distinction and personal discovery, and most importantly, it has provided an education to thousands who otherwise would not have had the opportunity. I think I know why President Kennedy quoted John Macefield. He was right. There are indeed few things more beautiful than a university. And I would add, there are few universities more beautiful than this one. Thank you. Have a blessed Lent and have a happy Easter. Thank you for your timely reflections, Father Malone. They're greatly appreciated by the entire Boston College community, and we're so thankful to have had you here with us this morning. Before we close our program, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I wanna thank all of you for joining our celebration today. We hope that you enjoyed this morning of spiritual reflection, and we look forward to the day when we can once again be together in person. And now, I'd like to introduce some very special guests. Anyone who's had the pleasure of attending the Tare Sunday in person can tell you that a highlight each year are the student performers whose talented voices typically fill Connie Forum and sounds of celebration. In keeping with this much-loved tradition, it's now my pleasure to introduce members of the University Chorale, along with their director, John Finney, to perform Hail Alma Mater. Thank you again for joining us, and take it away, John. Hey.